Hello and welcome to the video. In this video I will be sharing my brew of an all black IPA. I'll be sharing all my usual hints and tips and you never know I might even throw in a little bit of humour. So before we go into that let's look briefly into where the black IPA style actually originated from. Now I guess that everyone knows that the original IPA styles came out of England but actually the black IPA is an American original. It's often called a Cascadian Dark Ale or CDA for short on the west coast of the states and to be honest the west coast and the east coast are still arguing about where this actually originated from. Now you know some of those guys in the states they've got tanks, they've got anti-tank weapons and so on so I'm not going to get into that argument. All I'm going to say is it originated in the good old US of A. Okay, so moving swiftly on now, I think I got away with that, I certainly hope so at least. Black IPAs are actually popular worldwide these days, and there are styles coming out of some very interesting breweries, and one of my favourites is actually the New Zealand Black IPA. Those fantastically fruity New Zealand hops really complement the dark malts and the freshness of a Black IPA. Now, as I'm sure you all know, the Grainfather Brewing System is also from New Zealand, so I dedicate this beer to all of those behind this fantastic brewing system. And now onto my recipe for this brew. This full recipe is actually available in the YouTube description and also on the Grainfather Recipe Creator website database. The easiest way to find it on that database is not actually by title, but actually by my name and then all my recipes will come up for you. So there you go. And without any further ado, let's get on with the brew. Here's a quick look at my grain crush for this one. As usual, I've gone pretty fine, but not so fine that it will stick my sparge. So let's have a quick look at the mash in process. Uh, and as you can see, what I'm doing here is I'm gradually adding the grain giving it a nice stir up just to make sure that every single grain is wet and then repeating the process. This is certainly not something you want to go ahead and rush. For those of you that aren't enjoying the usual efficiencies from the grain father system, your grain crush and your mashing in process are the first two things that you should look at with a view to increasing those numbers. As a guide for newcomers, you should be able to easily obtain 75% brew house efficiency using the Grainfather brewing system. Skipping ahead now to the end, this is what your mash should look like once you've added all of your grain. Then all there is to do now is add that top mash plate, push it to the grain and then give it a slight lift and add all of the other parts that are needed before you put the uh, glass on top and start your mash. I also add a small and cheap sink strainer to the top of mine just to filter out any loose pieces due to my rather fine grain crush. Well you know this one isn't called a black IPA for no reason and this one has just two mash steps. The first one is actually at 67 degrees C or 152 Fahrenheit, just a little bit higher than you'd normally make an IPA because we really want those uh, dark malts to sing a little bit in contrast with the hops. And then of course you've got the regular mash out at 75 degrees C or 167 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can see here that I've got my sparge water heater on, I've got my various hop additions at the ready, I've already selected the yeast that I'm going to use for this one, and I've got the uh, Grainfather app running on my iPad. All set and going. So here's a quick look at my wart, just towards the end of the uh, mash out, and yep, it's still very black, so that's good. So moving on to the sparge now, and this is another one of those areas that if you're suffering with a lower efficiency than you should, then this is an area to look at. 
What I suggest you do with the sparge is you let the water drain out at the start so that you can actually see the mash plate completely visible. After that, gradually start adding the extra sparge water as per your recipe. And you can get all of these volume figures directly from the various Grainfather apps. So you can see that what I'm doing here is I'm adding a small amount of water, I'm letting it drain almost out before I add the next part. And this is really the trick. Don't ever go too high up and don't ever, ever fill it all the way up as one volume and then just expect that to be done because that will be a complete efficiency killer. At around 94 to 95 degrees Celsius, I look to actually remove the grain basket from the grain father, particularly if it's a lower batch volume like this one, the actual ramp up to the boil isn't really that long at all. So what I do before I actually remove this is give the uh, grain plate there just a quick push, just to make sure all the residual water actually finds its way out. So I've now had the alarm bell go to tell me that the grain father is at a boil, and yeah, it's not kidding. This is definitely boiling very strongly and nicely. So as per usual, before I actually start the timer for the boil, I'm actually stirring in all this foam off of the top, which is actually protein. Skipping ahead just a bit now, I've now actually got rid of most of the foam on top, and I'm going to add my first 60 minute hop addition. Once you've added your hop addition, it's now essential to give the wort a good stir. This will make sure that everything from those additions is absorbed with the wort. With the boil underway and still keeping a watchful eye on my grain father, I start cleaning my mash tun. And you know, it's really important that everything that you have connected with your brewing is kept squeaky clean and sanitary. And do this before you store it and you will avoid future problems. The other thing to mention is that during the boil there is certainly more to do than just adding your various different timed additions. One of them is dealing with protein foam as it comes along and not allowing it to build up too much, but also it's essential to scrape the bottom plate regularly to avoid any potential build up. When there are approximately between 12 and 10 minutes remaining in the boil, I pause the timer. I then set up, as you can see here on your screen, and run the boiling hot water through my system. This allows me to sanitise the entire counterflow chiller and gives me preparation for doing my whirlpool. I run the wort through for about two to three minutes and you'll see that it does drop the temperature of the wort. I then stop this recirculation through the counterflow chiller and then wait for the boil to ramp back up to 100 degrees Celsius before resuming my boil timer. I then add my yeast nutrient, which I would say is an essential ingredient to any beer brew. Once you've added your yeast nutrient, give it a stir in. So it's now zero minutes and it's time to add my whirlpool hops and give this thing a nice good stir up. Please note the use of brewing gloves here. Whilst I may not look particularly beer man macho, what they will do is shield your hands from any potential burns and also from getting extremely hot while doing a five minute whirlpool. Believe me, that heat really does start to increase as you go through a whirlpool. Once you've finished the whirlpool, it's essential to throw the spoon on the floor. Nah, actually, don't do that. But what you should definitely do is let it stand for about five minutes at the minimum just so that all of the uh, hop debris and so on uh, can fall to the bottom in a nice cone. Once your five minutes is up, it's now safe to start chilling your wort. Oh, and for pity's sake, pick your brewing spoon up off the floor. By the time you've done all of this, you can expect a temperature in this region. So I've connected my small uh, wort aerator to my bucket, and I'm now putting my uh, wort actually into the fermentation vessel. And you can see that I'm draining this from a height and coupled with the aeration pump, I'm getting a hell of a lot of air into my wort. And this is exactly what your yeast is hoping you will do. Speaking of which, here is the star of the show, Mangrove Jack's M07. I particularly like this yeast because of the residual sugar that it leaves behind. 
but you may decide to use something like M44, which is a much more neutral yeast and also brings the brew down to a drier taste. Now you'll note on the recipe for this brew that I actually quote some dry hops, but I'm personally not going to dry hop this beer. Sure, I know it's an IPA, but I actually prefer a different method, and I'm going to share that now with you. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to make a hop tea and introduce this before bottling this beer. Please see my other video all about making hop tea for brewing and also for improving beers that didn't quite go the way you intended. So there you go, that's the end of this particular video and I hope you all enjoyed it just as much as I enjoyed brewing this and sharing everything with you in this video. So if you did like this video then please do go ahead and like it on YouTube. This really helps me out and allows the videos to be seen by a wider audience on YouTube. I've got a lot of videos in the pipeline for the future so if you're interested in uh, seeing what I've got coming up then please subscribe for future content. If you have any questions on anything that I've covered in this video or in others or anything to do with brewing in general then please do not hesitate to get in touch. I'm more than happy to help. Until then, happy brewing!